The subject for today is entitled, When Did You Stop Being a Slave? I said, ask the person next to you that question. Look at him and say, when did you stop being a slave? Now, most people probably say, well, I ain't never been no slave. We need to ask you that question again. Because, believe it or not, brothers and sisters, to grow up in the cultural environment that we grew up in this country, and not just this country, uh, Europe has expanded its, its influential borders all over the world. To grow up under the domination of a culture that is not yours means that you are a slave to that culture until you've been liberated from that culture. One of the things that I think will help us in understanding this message today is perhaps we need to define what a slave is. Now, let, let, let me just see by a show of hands. Before I go any further, let me do a, a survey right quick, a, a one mass survey. How many of you here is a slave? All right. Got hands up. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you feel that you are not a slave? Got hands up. All right. Well, after I go through this definition, I'm going to ask that question again. And let's see if your answer still remains the same. The definition of a slave. What is a slave? A slave is a human being who is owned as property by another and is absolutely subject to the will of his or her owner. Okay. Some of you say, no, I don't fit that one. Let me share something with you that y'all may not know. The original, now notice what I'm saying. The original purpose or meaning of the marriage was a certificate of ownership. Y'all know that, did you? The certificate of marriage means that I, you are my property. Ah. I'll read the definition again. A slave is a human being who is owned as property by another and is absolutely subject to the will of his or her owner. That's not the end of the definition. Next part of the definition is a slave is a bond servant divested of all freedom and personal rights. Another part of the definition, check this part out now, listen carefully. A slave is someone who is completely dominated by an influence, a habit, a person, an entity, or a system. I read that one again. Somebody says, uh oh, I think that one got me. A slave is someone who is completely dominated by an influence, a habit, a person, an entity, or a system. For example, if you're in the military, you're a slave. Because this entity called the military 
completely dominates you and you are subject to the will of the government. If you work for the police department, you're a slave. Same thing. If you work for some big company that tells you when you better report to work. Like it or not, brothers and sisters, you're a slave. A slave is a person who is actuated and controlled by another. Come on and be honest. How many times you don't feel like going to work? And you end up going, don't you? You don't want to go. You really don't want to go. In fact, you don't want to go so bad, you're developing a serious attitude right about now. But you go, don't you? Because you are under the control of that other entity. Now, I ask you again. <laughs> are you a slave? In 1839, a brother by the name of Yusuf Sink, who was an African prince, was kidnapped by European oppressors and placed aboard a ship along with 52 other black Africans. And the ship was bound for Havana, Cuba. During the journey, these Africans came together as one unit. Even though they were from different tribes, on that slave ship, they put their tribal differences aside and unified themselves and organized a revolt. Let me tell you what they did. They killed the captain and the entire crew except for two white crewmen named Ruiz and Montez. Sink seized control of the ship and ordered the two white crewmen to turn the ship around and take it back to where you stole us from, which was Africa. However, the two young men were able to underhandedly maneuver the ship in a different direction and it came toward America. The ship was spotted off the coast of Long Island and the Africans along with their leader, Yosef Sink, were captured and taken to port in Connecticut where they were put in prison. Now, mind you, Sink did not know how to speak English too well. But he chose to speak in his own defense at his trial, in his own language, which was the Mindy language. But here's what amazes me, because see, you gotta understand, this was an African prince. It was something about the way he carried himself. That even though he couldn't speak English, he stood in this Connecticut courtroom and presented his case to the judge with such African dignity yeah, yeah. that the judge was moved to free them and let them return to Africa. In case you don't know about this story, <laughs> It was portrayed in a movie called Amistad. This situation raised the question, if an African was captured to be sold into slavery but escaped to free territory, was he still legally a slave? That's the question that came from that situation. 
But believe it or not, brothers and sisters, not long after this, there was a man by the name of Dred Scott. And the Dred Scott decision answered that question. Dred Scott, a young slave, and guess where he was from? <laughs> right here, Missouri, traveled to Illinois with his slave master. Years later, while the two were still living in free territory, because Illinois was considered free territory, Scott's slave master died. He left his estate, including his slave, Dred Scott, in the hands of his wife. And Scott insisted that since his residence in a free state made him a free man, that he was no longer a slave. Y'all following this? So Scott brought a lawsuit against his slave master's wife. And it was a very widely publicized case. But I want you to understand this. The Supreme Court ruled that Scott was to remain a slave even though he had become a free man. Did y'all hear what I just said? The Supreme Court ruled that Scott was to remain a slave even though he had become a free man. How secure is your freedom? In the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford decision, of 1857, the Supreme Court ruled, and I want y'all to hear these words because it's a quote from the court transcripts. That, and I quote, a black man has no rights. A white man is bound to respect. End of quote. Did y'all hear what I said? Now what kind of court is that? that would come to such a ruling. And guess what, brothers and sisters? The Supreme Court just reinforced that ruling a few months ago in what was called the elections. They acted the same thing out all over again. A black man, black folk don't have any rights that a white man is bound to respect. Mm -mm -mm. All these black folk, we got the right to vote. We got the right to vote. They showed you, didn't they? Come on, talk to me. They showed you. You don't have the right to do nothing because they went ahead with their and put this blank in office. This decision has been viewed by historians as one of the worst, one, one of the most ill-conceived decisions by a Supreme Court justice. Yes, yes. Let me show you how this concept, a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. Let me show you how this still plays out today. Everybody say the modern day slave patrol. The modern day slave patrol. Now, the only way, brothers and sisters, that I know to foster accurate African liberation. Did y'all hear how I said that? Yes, yes. The only way I know to foster accurate African liberation is to educate you. Yes to our story, to educate you to what really happened on yesterday. Because as long as you don't know what happened on yesterday, you can't make your today strong. You understand what I'm saying? The only way, 
that you will not fall into the same snare today as you must understand how you fell yesterday. You don't know how you fell. Trust me, you will fall again. Look at the person next to you and say, we better learn from our mistakes. What is the modern day slave patrol? It's called the police department. America's police departments, believe it or not, brothers and sisters, actually grew out of what was called the slave patrol system. You see, many years ago, before the slave patrol system came into effect, up until that time, justice was administered by local sheriffs and deputies and marshals. But after the Revolutionary War, most states developed some type of militia in case armed soldiers were needed for national defense. But the institution of slavery, what did I just say? The institution of slavery. The institution of what? Slavery. slavery. The institution of slavery required that some type of organized law enforcement would have to be instituted on a regular basis for the purpose of protecting white slave owners against the uprising of their black slaves. Are y'all following this thing here? There's a book called From Slavery to Freedom by Franklin. And, and in this book on page 142, Franklin describes how the slave patrols worked. I encourage you to get this book. Notice what he says, and I quote, one of the devices set up to enforce the slave codes and thereby maintain the institution of slavery was the slave patrol. Yes, yes. Counties were usually divided into beats. You know, like a police officer says, I'm walking my beat. Or areas of patrol. And check this out now, and white men were called upon to serve for a period of time, one, three, or six months. These patrols had three responsibilities. Now follow these responsibilities well. The first responsibility of the slave patrol was to apprehend slaves who were out of place and return them to their masters or lock them in jail. What did I just say? Out of place, right? Yeah. Okay. The second duty was to visit unannounced slave quarters <laughs> and search for various kinds of weapons that might be used in an uprising. We call it a raid today. The third purpose of the slave patrol was to visit assemblies of slaves unannounced where disorder might develop or where conspiracies for uprising would be planned. That was the job of the slave patrol. The patrol system literally gave every white person authority over every black person, whether the black person was free or a slave. Well, what do we mean by the modern day patrol system? Well, brothers and sisters, today, all over the country, the conditions are the same as back then. Follow what I'm telling you. Police officers today, regularly, whenever they get ready, will stop black motorists particularly young black male motorists demanding to see their driver's license. 
with the same threatening air of authority that the old slave patrollers demanded to see the passes of the slaves. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And if you don't have your driver's license just like back then, if you didn't have your pass, you were arrested or given a summons or returned back to your master. Oh, this is some deep stuff. When did you stop being a slave? There's, and I hope this message gets out to my people so they can see the program and begin to do something about it. There's another entity at work in our society. It's called the Housing Projects. Look at the person next to you and say, the projects is designed to prepare you for jail. Can I talk African liberation here today? Now, although many institutions profit from the menace of drugs and crime, in order to keep it from destroying white America, the powers that be decided that it must be contained within the black community, which itself must be contained in order to be controlled. Now follow this, brothers and sisters. I'm not just telling you some stuff that I'm thinking here. No, come on, baby. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In the year 1945, uh -huh. what year did I say, y'all? Right, now see, young people, some of y'all have got to do uh, black history reports in school. If you want, I'll give you my notes. Okay, and you can read this for your black history report. In 1945, the 79th Congress's Subcommittee on Urban Affairs of the Joint Committee issued a report which had the solution to the problem of containing the Negroes. The Joint Committee studied ways that black people could be contained in crowded living conditions and not spread out into the surrounding community. Their conclusion was published in a pamphlet entitled Urban America, Goals and Problems. And I quote from the pamphlet, and here's what it says. The main problem for us with the enclaves, and I like the way to use words that they know most of our folk don't know what the meaning of it is. So let me tell you what an enclave is. An enclave, E-N-C-L-A-V-E, -E, is a minority culture group living as an entity within a larger group. Did you catch that? An enclave is a minority culture group living as an entity within a larger group. So what they're calling the enclave is black folk living in white America. So it goes on to say, the main problem for us with the enclaves as it is now placed in the sinks. Now that's deep because the sinks, S-I-N-K-S, when we think sinks, we think something in our kitchen. Follow what I'm saying? But here, the word sinks means an area that has been designed. Hear what I'm telling you. An area that has been designed to foster moral filth and corruption. So these people have been placed in areas that have been designed to foster moral filth and corruption. Goes on to say, when the Negro population increase, increases at a rate that the enclave is unable to convert them, only two choices remain. Okay. Okay. 
And here's what they said. One is territorial growth. In other words, give them more land or overcrowding. It goes on to read, apart from letting sinks or these areas designed to foster moral filth and corruption, apart from letting these sinks run its course and destroy the city, there is an alternative solution. And here's what they say. Pre-pack, ain't that deep? It actually has the word pre-pack in this document. Pre-pack or introduce design features that will counteract out undesired effects of the sink. In other words, create an environment that will foster violence and destruction among a people within that contained environment without it spreading out into the community. Mm -hmm. mm, 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 mm. A study by a pathologist named Charles Southwick discovered that certain mice <laughs> could tolerate high cage densities. So to increase the density in a rat population and maintain healthy specimen, three things were required. Everybody say this with me. The first was to put them in boxes where they can't see each other. That was the first part of the experiment. Second part was to clean their cages. The third part is give them enough to eat. Now this is what these pathologists was necessary for mice to live in a crowded, packed environment without turning on each other. Y'all following this thing? The experiments revealed that under these conditions, the mice could be contained and piled in boxes up as many stories as they desired. And from this experiment, the United States Urban Housing Projects were born and spread throughout the country under what is now known as HUD, Housing and Urban Development. Right. Brothers and sisters, why y'all think they call them projects? That's right. Okay. <laughs> because it's a project. That's right. yes. mm -hmm. what it is. Right, I live in the projects, yes. yes? It's amazing, just look across the country. I mean, here you have a city yes. Yes. within a city. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they've developed this program so well that violence, riots, murder, rapings, everything happens right in that project environment and don't even cross the street to go into the community that the projects are in. I mean, the, the, the psyche of this thing, brothers and sisters, is so deep that we have people who have been in the projects for six generations. We got folk who don't know that there's another part of the world but the projects. We got folk who are cousins all in the projects because the brother in building one likes the sister in building three. Right. And the brother and sister get together and they have a baby. And as that baby grows up, the baby gets attracted to somebody who lives in building two. And then they have a baby and that baby gets attracted to the little girl who lives in building four. And they have a baby and three or four generations down the road, you got a family all in this one housing development. It's a project. Now, what's really deep, brothers and sisters, I'm getting ready to read some heavy stuff to you now. The report goes on to read that, and I quote, 
The implementation of such a problem, listen, y'all hear this. The implementation of such a project would require the combined efforts of many diverse specialists, all working secretly. Y'all hear that? Working secretly and closely together on a massive scale. Yes, this is in this government report, what I'm reading to you. It goes on to say, the experts needed for this project will be city planners, architects, engineers, economists, law enforcement specialists, traffic and transportation experts, educators, Lawyers, social workers, political scientists, psychologists, anthropologists, ethologists, and guess what the last one is? And preachers. Good God Almighty. The government actually states in this report that one of the people needed to pull off this project would be preachers. God dog it. Yes. Shucks. Oh, the report went on to read, check this out, y'all. Some of the quote, some of the most capable help is Negro enclave specialists. Now notice how they're referring to Negroes who live in the ghetto. Negro enclave specialists. It goes on to say, hire as many of them as you can and maintain contact. In other words, they're saying, study how the Negroes think. I mean, people I hear what I'm saying. It actually says in the report, in their presence, don't talk. <laughs> Listen and let them talk. <laughs> Do you hear this? Yes. Look at the person next to you and say, that's why you need to stop running your mouth so much. <laughs> we get around the oppressor and we just run our mouth we tell them everything about ourselves. And they're sitting back taking it in. Why would you talk to your enemy? Why would you laugh at those corny jokes? Your enemy. You know I'm telling you. They want have you heard this one? And you all say, I don't want to hear this one. Stop right there. I don't even want to hear it. Right, don't even talk to the hand. I like that one. I like that one, Doc. Don't even talk to the hand. I like that. It goes on to say, in their presence, don't talk. Listen and let them talk. Remember, it is important to learn about them in order to forward our desired effects. Are y'all hearing this? Take the person, put your elbow on the person next and say, wake up. Some of y'all just hit somebody, they woke up and said, amen. read from this report, brothers and sisters, it goes on to say, it is absolutely essential to us that we learn more about how to compute the maximum, the minimum, and the density of the Negro enclaves that make up our cities. In other words, they're actually saying to, this, to the agents to carry this out, it's important that we get to learn as much as we can about the Negroes but we can't just learn it from afar, so we want to hire you to get in there among them and learn about them. Now, who you think they're hiring to get in there among us 
and then report back to them about us. Us. And it's still going on today. It goes on to say, through the, check this people, as I, I'm not lying, as I was doing this research, I got angry. It says, through the process of taming, did y'all hear what I just said? Through the process of taming most higher organisms, including Negro men. Now, didn't say Negro women, because the target here is emasculating the black man. Through the process of taming, including Negro men, can be squeezed into a given area, provided that they constantly have a minimum amount of food provided for them, that they are made to feel safe, and their aggressions are under control. Right. <laughs> End of that quote. Now, let me tell y'all something. This report that I'm talking about here clearly exposes the truth that many of us have been and still are in denial about. The truth is that the overcrowded, violent, drug-infested black community is the consequence of a strategically designed and carefully laid out plan to contain and control black people. Yes. The government project revealed that rats in the experiment when kept clean and well fed remain relatively peaceful. But when deprived of food and clean conditions they became violent. The United States Government Housing Project residents, of which more than 90% are people of color. Did y'all hear what I said? More than 90% of the residents of the projects across this country are people of color, who are financially deprived because they can't make ends meet on a welfare check, yes, yes. living off food stamps and what have you, because yes. they won't let them have a job or their, their skills are so poor by design that they can't secure adequate employment or what we call they are underemployed. So they're financially depraved as a result of that. They're hungry. And not only are they forced hungry and financially depraved, but they're forced to live in filth because the city won't come clean up like they're supposed to. Well, when people, our people, are forced to live in those conditions, unlike the mice, we become more than violent. Now, how do we become more than violent? Because isn't it something that after these conditions are strategically designed, somehow or another, Glock handguns ends up in these projects. Isn't it deep? We ain't got the money to go food shopping, but we got the money to buy a Mac 10. How is it that these handguns and these weapons of war end up in the hands of a people who are already angry because of their condition? Are y'all seeing this thing? So, brothers and sisters, with these weapons of war, we not only become violent, we become deadly. Oh my goodness. How else does this program play out? Everybody look at the person next and say, they're building more prisons. They're building more prisons. <laughs> I told you that the projects was getting you ready for jail. Now, of course, that's not 100% across the board. You, you find a few brothers and sisters who escape the program. 
But when you look at the masses who are caught up in the program, the few that escape the program are the exception to the rule. The wide scale availability of drugs has made it necessary for groups to fight for control of their territory where drugs may be sold. And we call it the drug wars today. And I need, I want y'all to understand, there are drug wars going on, but don't you ever lie to yourself and make you think there's a war on drugs. Did you hear what I said? There are drug wars going on, but there is no war on drugs, brothers and sisters. I had a brother say to me, who was assigned to the DEA, the North Office, North New Jersey Office of the DEA, he said to me, he said, Ray, we don't want to clean up the drugs. He said, don't you understand, brother, that if we take the drugs off the street, I'll be out of a job. I said, man, you know, I never thought of that. If crime drops, police departments would have to lay folk off. Yes, they would. So you see, when crime does begin to drop, when drugs do begin to get uh, short in supply on the street, somehow or another the property room or the evidence room gets raided and the drugs that were seized three weeks ago ends up back on the street. Somehow or another, the doggone it, we didn't go in there and get it. It ends up back in our community, but we didn't go get it. Y'all yeah. don't like this message, do you? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you the truth, I really don't care. I got a job to do. Just as Europeans sold guns and whiskey to rival African nations in return for their prisoners of war, much of the violence conducted in America's urban streets today are instigated by the sale, sale of guns and drugs to rival street gangs, which are also provided by Europeans. The Europeans supplied weapons to African tribes and nations so they could kill off each other. And guess what, y'all? They're doing the same thing today. They're supplying drugs and weapons to gangs out here, our young brothers and sisters, so that they can kill off each other. Young man who's in prison named David Walker in the May 16, 1992 edition of the International Sun newspaper he wrote an article entitled, Society Creates and Maintains the Climate for Crime and Imprisonment. And I quote Brother Walker, here's what he says. In a society which deliberately manufactures people to be prison bound, illiterate, unemployable, destitute, and drug alcohol induced, we can never afford the luxury of not taking the initiative in the welfare and safety of our community. I want to repeat that line again, y'all. We can never afford to take the luxury of not taking the initiative in the welfare and safety of our community. Look at the person next to you and say, who's going to protect us if we don't? Who's going to protect us if we don't? He goes on to say, prisons are multi-million dollar industries. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They're springing up everywhere and they employ mostly Caucasians. Yes, right. yes. Again, our welfare is taken out of our hands. He goes on to say, prisons are strategically placed in predominantly Caucasian regions. Yes. Think about that. Those of you who have prison, loved ones in prison, you got to go see them. Where are you going to see them? Are you going to see them down in urban communities or out, way out? Way out. Where we don't live. Brother brought out a good point. He said, 
The reason why the prisons are situated here is because in this way, no one having an interest in the people inside will be anywhere around should they decide to exterminate us. Prisons were made to punish, not rehabilitate. However, in spite of this major flaw, prison, I don't have to be honest with you, prison provides something that many inmates need for self-reformation. But they never find it in their day-to-day -day activities on the street because they're too busy trying to survive. Everybody say this, in prison, in prison, a person has time to think. A person has time to think. It's all in it's broken. El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Yes, right. Y'all may not know who I'm talking about. Y'all call him Malcolm X. Yes, Became transformed in prison by simply reading books. Through books, Malcolm learned about history. In prison, through books, Malcolm learned about politics, geography, religion, philosophy, and law. Just from reading books in prison. While reading about the opium wars between China and England, Malcolm discovered how governments use drug addiction as a political tool for the control of the people and in his autobiography he reflects on the politics behind the Chinese drug problem which led to China closing its doors to the world after World War II. According to Malcolm, these are his words and I quote him, he says, when a white man professes ignorance about why the Chinese hate him so, my mind can't help flashing back to what I read while I was in prison about how the blood forebearers of these same white men raped China at a time when China was trusting and helpless. Those original white Christian traders, what kind of traders did I just say? Those original white Christian traders sent into China millions of pounds of opium. By 1839, so many of the Chinese were addicts that China's desperate government destroyed 20,000 chests of opium. The first opium war was created and declared by the white man. Listen, brothers and sisters, imagine declaring war on somebody who refuses to become a drug addict. <laughs> Did y'all hear what I said? Why would you declare war on somebody who refuses to become a drug addict? Come on. Doggone it, but that's what was done. The Chinese were severely beaten with the gunpowder that they invented. In 1901, the Chinese, their cry, their war cry was, kill the foreign white devils. That was their cry. I think maybe we in the black community need to learn a lesson from the Chinese. Oh, you don't have to like what I'm saying. But just like the white man had such a negative effect on China, they're doing the same thing to black people all over the world, especially in the motherland and in our urban communities here. I'm talking about a system called racism designed to, sh to destroy a people. There's a system at work in our society, brothers and sisters. Good God Almighty, I feel the spirit of Brother Khalid rising up in me yes, now. Sir. Yeah, but there's a system at work 
And we got the responsibility of doing even what the Bible says, and that's stand up and cry loud and spam not. Yeah. 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 Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion and show my people their sins. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, we have become participants in our own destruction. Yeah. Yeah. Because we support the very system that's designed to destroy us. Not only do we support it, doggone it, we protect it. A system that is focused on neutralizing the members of the African community. And I got news for you. If Africans do not get up and determine their destiny, Europeans will determine it for us. Did I lose y'all? If we as Africans don't get up and determine our destiny, the Europeans will determine our destiny for us. And I want you to know something, brothers and sisters. They are worried about their survival. And the best way to ensure their survival is to get rid of you. Oh, man. The European powers are very content when Africans sit around and do nothing. Yeah, yeah, come on. See, this lets them know that their investment in modern devices of slavery are about to yield a massive return. Because when you are not productive black folk, you will resort to crime. When you are not productive black folk, you will get despondent. When you are not productive black folk, you will lose your energy of self-determination. And there ain't but one thing left after that, and that's to depend on the oppressor. I ask you again, are you still a slave? When did you stop being a slave? Every African man, every African woman and child ought to vow every day of your life when you wake up that you will not tolerate the perpetuation of slavery. There are some Africans who think that because they have a little bit of money, because they own their own house out there with them, you think that you are not victims of the perpetuation of slavery. But I want you to know something that the house slave got better food than the field slave. The house slave had better privileges than the field slave. The house slave even had a little bit of education over the field slave, but like it or not, they were still a slave. And that's what you need to understand, doggone it. Almost like the almost like a French poodle looking at a cocker spaniel talking about you look terrible. Cocker spaniel looked at the French poodle and said, yeah, but you still a dog. Ooh, buddy. Africans, we must develop a sacredness for survival. God, dog, I'm feeling this thing up here. Any institution in our community that is actively involved in raising the consciousness of our people ought to become a priority in your life. Yes. Did you hear what I said? Yes. That's what I be trying to get y'all to understand. Y'all, this ain't just another church. Yes. Doggone it, I ain't here to just have a good time. I don't know what you come to do. That stuff is going all over the city. Yes. Gotta be somewhere in this city where you can come and get your African mind together. of unity and anybody I do mean anybody that would cause disunity among Africans need to be removed from the community by Africans we must stop 
doing the work of our enemy. Let me close this thing here because I'm about to take off up here. Now if I take off, I won't finish. Got to finish first. Yes. African people, do you know who you are? Who you really are? Do you know, African people, that you can be what you want to be? If you try to be what you can be. African people, do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're really going? Do you know that you can learn what you want to learn if you try to learn what you can learn? African people, do you know that you are strong? They've tried to help hold us back, yes. keep us down, and here we still are. Yes. Do you realize how strong you are, African people? How really strong you are? Do you know that you can do what you want to do if you try to do what you can do? Yes. <sighs> African people, yes. be what you can be. Learn what you can learn. Do what you can do. And tomorrow, our nation will be what we want it to be and not what they want it to be. Ashe. Ashe.